Estimating the big four costs, materials, labor, equipment, and subcontractors. These four items are considered the big four. They're your primary sources of costs. And these are costs that will be needed to be incurred in order to get a job done. So remember when we're doing an estimate, we definitely want to recover the costs that we have to spend in order to get a job done. This has nothing to do with our profit or the operation of uh, running a business. This is just the costs that are associated with a specific job. And so they're uh, easy to lay out in these kind of big four categories. Let's look at each one. First up, materials. Initially, determining your material cost is fairly straightforward. You need to determine uh, the amount of materials that you need to buy, so your quantity, and then the price that you pay for those materials. And typically, it's a wholesale price. We're assuming you're a contractor or a company that purchases from a wholesale distributor. It can be kind of tricky to get some of these costs if you are not currently a contractor, but we'll take a look at some of these in greater detail. Estimating software can uh, take material sometimes directly from a plan, an architectural plan, and insert it straight into bidding software, which is great uh, and saves a lot of time. But it's important that you understand the intricacies of it so that you could double check the computer's work. And many times more material is needed to construct the landscape than is used in the final product. I'll show you an example here in a second, but material can be lost, wasted, or require replacement. And there's defects as well. For example, a design may call for 1,113 and a half feet of two inch pipe. So where will you purchase half a foot of pipe? Where will you purchase 13 feet of pipe for that matter? Pipe, as you will learn, is generally sold in 20 foot lengths. But if you only purchase 1,120 feet of pipe, rounding up to the nearest 20, I can guarantee that you will run out before the job is finished. Why do I know you'll run out? Because you will need to make several cuts and uh, welds in between different joints. And so just because uh, 1,120 includes all the feet. You're going to have different sizes and different sections and different pieces. And so you actually need to be thinking about how many feet you will need to be purchasing in 20 foot increments. Now, when it comes to plant material, a lot of times the contractor will choose to provide a guarantee which means if anything dies within a year, it gets replaced free of charge. So if you're providing a guarantee or a warranty of plant material, what you're basically doing is ensuring that the plants are going to live. So in order to do that, you think like an insurance person, you determine a risk or a loss factor for each kind of plant. You'll add a percentage for loss to the wholesale price before you add it to the estimate. For example, a shrub that may cost you $7 has a 5% risk factor. What that means is you think with your experience that there's a 5% chance that the plant will not make it when you put it in. Uh, it could also mean to you that you have a 95% chance of all your plants living or uh, if you plant 20, one out of 20, is that what it is? One out of 20 uh, are going to die or not make it. So you add 5% to your $7. So you take a calculator, you determine what is 5% of $7. You realize it's 35 cents and you add 35 cents to your $7 plant. Let's say you have a tree, it's a boxed tree, it's gonna cost you $80, 
and that image is not uh, going to cost you $80. That'll cost you $80,000 perhaps. But uh, because it's a larger item, it may have a higher risk, a lower chance of surviving. So you might give it a 30% chance that it's not going to make it. And so what you do is you take 30% of $80, and on the estimate sheet, you will price it up to $104. Now, the reason you can do this is uh, there, you're not going to have to pay that 30% for every single one of your plants. But in the end, if your risk factor is accurate, then you will have recovered the costs of having to go and replace plants. And just take a look at those images, kind of interesting, the large oak tree there boxed up in what looks to be like a six foot, eight foot box. And then uh, over on the left, the number one containers, one gallon plants, and look at how they're stacking those. You can get a lot of plants in a short space when you stack it like that pyramid. That's meant for some kind of a restoration project, and those are living plants in the containers. Now, any material you buy, typically you are buying from uh, a wholesale uh, vendor, but that vendor likely buys it themselves. So it's very rare that you go straight to a manufacturer of a product to purchase things. So you're often buying from Ewing or Site One or Hydroscape or wholesale nurseries. And those vendors are buying material at their wholesale price and then they resell it to you at a re-wholesale price. So in this case the contractor you're typically paying 30 to 60 percent more than what the vendor buys the material for. And the retail price is usually marked up at least a hundred percent over the wholesale price. So if you don't know what the the true wholesale price or what your purchase price would actually be. You know, you can call the company and get a quote or sometimes on websites they actually show pricing. But you can take a retail price and you can drop that down and make certain assumptions about how much you would be paying, noting that uh, you're going to be paying somewhere between 30 and 60 percent of the retail price. In order to price plant materials, Usually you email a plant list to the wholesale nursery and you ask for prices and availability. Uh, in order to do that, you'll need to give them the species name and that's the scientific name with any cultivars, the container size and the quantity. And uh, usually the wholesaler will reply with a lump sum price as opposed to individual prices. Uh, they want to protect their business and they don't want you shopping around. They do not want you to kind of nickel and dime or say, well, if uh, this cultivar is $2 extra, can I swap it out for that one? Uh, but you can ask. You can ask them to give a line item and p potentially they'd be willing to do it. And some nurseries will give you uh, an item cost on your, um, on your products. But it's important to be able to ask the right questions and knowing the scientific name becomes very important. And if you're in our plant ID classes and you get acquainted with the Plant Master software, uh, I actually helped to create the nursery order form option that you have within Plant Master, where you can actually produce a table that has species, cultivar, container size, and quantity fairly easily and send that off to nurseries to get your quote. So even though you have many different types of materials you need to purchase, uh, in general, you can follow a simple formula, and basically your material cost is going to be the item price uh, multiplied by a waste percentage. So uh, that's not counting the guarantee for plant material, but you, there's going to be a certain amount that you will have to waste, whether it's pipe or fertilizer or soil. You need to add any cost for freight. So if you pay for a delivery or if you go and pick up the material, you should account for the cost of getting the material to the job site. 
and then of course you need to add the sales tax and that's uh, different for every city where you're purchasing the product. Now let's take a look at labor. I use a couple of uh, textbooks when I teach estimating and um, one of the best ones I'll try to make available to you all as an ebook. I've got scans of it. Uh, it's out of print. You can't buy it anymore, but it's a, it's a great one. And there's a quote in here that says, um, I'll actually read a couple of quotes. A major bonding company conducted a survey of contractors who had declared bankruptcy to discover why they went bankrupt. Do you know how many contractors they found who had gone broke due to lack of work? None. Do you know how many contractors had gone bankrupt because they had taken on too much work, too fast, and for too cheap? Lots of them. And then another quote from that text is that a contractor's primary focus must be the control of labor and overhead. Uh, it's typically best to estimate labor in production hours. There's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one is that your wages will change. People will get raises. The minimum wage goes up. Everybody uh, may have different amounts that they're being paid while they're on the job. And it's easier to just convert all of your money, your wage, into production hours. And then you can use those as units to estimate your cost. And it's also easier to communicate those hours to your customer without having to explain the price of those hours. So if a customer has a question about something, you can say, well, it takes 10 hours or at least 20 hours to do that job. And this is why the cost is so high. So for example, if I know that I can pour 30 square feet of con concrete per hour, and I have uh, 300 square feet to pour, then how many production hours does this job entail? 30 square feet per hour, and I have 300 square feet to pour. Pretty simple math. You can see that uh, 10 production hours is what it would require to do 300 square feet. If I know I can do 30 square feet an hour. Additionally, if I can put in five feet of water line per hour, how many feet can I install? If I know I only have 10 production hours to do, this is kind of working backwards here. So if I have 10 production hours and I can put in five feet of water per hour, again, it's simple math. I know I can do 50 feet in 10 hours. How do I know I can do five feet of water per hour or 30 square feet of concrete per hour? Experience. So you have to have done the job a little bit or at least uh, taken good notes every time you complete a job. You should try to update your average time. You don't want to be forcing employees to work like crazy and get things done as fast as possible. You want to account for uh, a good healthy working pace but eventually you come up with an idea of how many hours it takes to do specific jobs. When we look at the fact that wages change, uh, we can especially look in the state of California and realize that we're in the middle of a uh, minimum wage increase that is going up to $15 an hour by January 1st of 2023 for all businesses. For Large businesses with more than 26 full-time employees, uh, 2022 is where you hit $15 an hour. And where are we currently? Well, we're currently right here in this $12 and $13 an hour range for minimum wage. You can see every year we will expect a dollar increase until $15 an hour. And not only do your minimum wage earners earn uh, bonuses, but uh, typically all of your employees would get that same equivalent raise. And if you have uh, people on salary, uh, usually the law is that they have to make double minimum wage. So look in 2017, getting 10 bucks an hour. If you had someone salaried, they're getting 20 bucks an hour. Now at 2023, $15 an hour, maybe doesn't sound like too much of a raise, five bucks but your salaried folks now need to be making $30 an hour. And so uh, 
this will have rising costs in all businesses. Additionally, there's uh, variability in your jobs. Some jobs may be large and therefore you can rent equipment to make the labor time multiplied, or it may be small and you'll have to be digging by hand. You may not have the space to get equipment into an area, and so you are forced to dig by hand. So instead of a dollar value per plant or in the ground or per tree, uh, you may want to consider the steps required to get each job done in hours. So here, for example, if a landscape contractor can plant one tree every hour and 30 minutes, if the tree is transported to the planting hole, if there are 10 trees to plant, but only five can be accessed by truck, the other five must take, or they could take an extra half hour just to get them to the planting hole. So you can see large trees, they weigh a lot and it takes a lot of time to transport them. So initially you'd have 15 hours for your hour and a half per tree with 10 trees, but then you'd have to account for an extra two and a half hours for five of those trees requiring an extra 30 minutes because of the lack of access. And so then you would, in your head or at, on your sheet, you'd write down 17 and a half hours for labor for planting trees. Now, finally, you want to communicate uh, your labor costs in hours because it helps to streamline and simplify everything. So you may estimate that the total labor to plant trees is $900. But uh, that sounds like a lot of money. So to more effectively explain that it uh, would take 80 production hours, then they, the client will typically be more willing to understand the reason for the price. And your supervisor, the four person, will more easily be able to get the job done. Now, when we say 80 production hours, we're not automatically going to assume that takes two weeks because that would that would be what one person could do. But if it's going to take 80 hours and we put two people on that job, each of those people doing 40 hours a week, we can estimate that it will take one week. If we double that and if we put four people on the job, it will take 80 hours divided by four. So that will take 20 hours of time, half of a week. So you can see how you can easily use production hours to allocate resources and labor. To make this big job easier, it is helpful to break the project down into separate tasks and uh, helps to make them easy to work. And some of these tasks you may be subcontracting out. But uh, for the example of an installation, you have your subgrade, your wood construction, any wall construction, a pond, uh, amending the soil, putting plants in the ground, adding mulch on top, gravel, decomposed granite pathways, boulder installation, uh, wood construction, arbors, pergolas, fences. So all of those things you break into separate tasks and try to estimate the amount of working hours required to get those jobs done. Because each person very likely can earn a different wage, you could take this down to very detailed levels and put each person's wage in there. But what is more commonly done is develop something called the average crew wage. And so if you know you always have three people out on a job or two people out on a specific site, just average together what they're making. And so in this example, we have a four person crew. The lead person, the supervisor or the four person is making $23 an hour. The, you may have like a lead worker, someone who uh, is helping and more experienced, uh, helping the other workers to get the job done right. They're making 1750. And then you may have some people who are new or recently hired or young summer jobs, high school students, whatever it is, 1475 or even 12 bucks an hour. And these are just sample prices. 
So, uh, you know, they would vary. But uh, you take the total of all of those uh, people's wages in dollars per hour, and you divide it by the number of people on the crew. So in this case, four. And we get a crew average wage of $16.81. Now, anytime I use estimating for my production hours, I'm putting a dollar value to that. Instead of trying to do all four people's wages uh, separately, I will just take that 1681 and apply that to my production hours. Overtime can be a big cost for labor. There's three ways in California that you may end up paying overtime to employees. There's three ways you can be earning overtime if you are an employee. The first is if you work more than eight hours in a day, anything over eight hours, you should be paid time and a half, 1.5 times your hourly wage. And then if there's anything over 40 hours in a week, then that's also time and a half. And then the third way is if you work any amount of time on the seventh day of a work week, that's also time and a half. Most of the time we think about overtime as any amount of hours over 40 in a week, in a 40 hour work week. So if you average 50 hours a week, you're paying uh, one and a half times the wage of 10 extra hours, 10 hours of overtime. So one way to account for that is to think of it like uh, you're actually paying for 15 hours of work. So instead of 50 hours or 40 hours, it would be 55 hours per week. But five of those hours are non-productive hours. Does that make sense to you? So the way to account for that is you can get an overtime percentage. You take your 50 hours a week, you divide it by those five hours that are non-productive, and that would get you 50 divided by five is 10, and that would be your overtime percentage. That's how you account for that. So if we took our 1681 per hour, that's our average crew wage, and we know we're going to work 50 hours a week, we will multiply 1681 by 10% or by 0.1, and we'll get 1.68. So a dollar 68 is how much we're paying in overtime per hour. So now we add that dollar 68 to our 1681 crew average wage. And you can see that brings us up to $18.49 an hour that we're paying our crew to work. Now, finally, this is the first point where we bring in what's called a fudge factor in estimating. It's what one of the textbooks calls it, the fudge factor. And uh, 5 to 15% is the recommended range you might put in here. And this is for your labor costs. And this simply is accounting for any kind of differences in your estimate. So for example, if you know people lose their keys and things take longer, if there's bad weather, or if uh, you know people are, for whatever reason, taking a little extra amount of time, you can give yourself a little bit of extra here in the labor cost recovery. So if you're going to go between 5 and 15 percent, let's go ahead and just uh, estimate a 10 percent fudge factor. So we had $18.49 an hour, but uh, we're going to say we're 10 percent inefficient. And so that 10 percent is an extra dollar and 84 cents. So now you can see our average crew wage gets bumped up to $20.33 and 33 cents per hour. So every time we consider our productive hours, we will be multiplying the hours it takes by $20 and 33 cents. I've already spoken with you about uh, cost recovery for equipment, but we're gonna go through it again just so you get the point. 
Some estimators will take shortcuts and they can determine that uh, the equipment is kind of a percentage of the labor hours, uh, but usually that's not recommended. Uh, I recommend what's called the machine rate method for cost recovery, and that's coming up with a basically a wage for each of your pieces of equipment. So anytime your lawnmower is working, you should be accounting for the cost of that lawnmower to be working. So in this case, you're, you're estimating your equipment similarly to how you estimate your labor. You just treat them in uh, numbers like, a, like another one of your employees. So what you end up doing is you add up your different costs for your equipment and you end up with what's determined as productive machine hours to determine the rate. Let's go ahead with our pickup truck example. These are 2019 numbers. Uh, last time we did this was 2020 numbers, which I would recommend you use, but 2019 will work for us. So if we have a 2019 Ford F-150, you can Google the MSRP. You can find that it's $28,155. And typically you would be financing that over a number of years. Let's just say three years and there's 4.21% interest. How do I get those numbers? I literally just Google it. What is the average interest rate? What is the average finance uh, year number of years for a truck? Where are you gonna buy the vehicle? You look up the sales tax for that city, and here we'll say, uh, I think this is Chula Vista, 8.25% sales tax. So you take your $28,155, you add your 4.21% that you'll be paying in interest, and then you add your 8.25% that you'll be paying in sales tax, and your total cost is $30,478. So we need to determine how much it's gonna be to replace this truck when it's no longer useful. And we already said it's a three-year loan, so we're going to plan to replace it after those three years. And so we've got our $30,000 with a three-year life expectancy. You might say to yourself, I can use a truck for a lot longer than three years. But if it's a work vehicle where it's getting uh, eight hours plus per day, every day, with uh, manual labor and hauling equipment and tools, you want to be able to uh, have a reliable vehicle. So you try to think of a shorter life expectancy, uh, shorter life expectancy typically than maybe your personal vehicle. So we'll say three years and we'll say we're working 40 hours a week with this truck. So if you take 40 hours per week, you multiply that by 52 uh, weeks in a year, you get 2,080 hours per year. So 2,000 hours a year times three years, the, the hours per lifetime of this vehicle is 6,240 hours. Now you divide your uh, purchase price of $30,000, divide that by the number of hours it's gonna work, and that's 6,240 hours in three years, and you end up with $4.88 per hour. That's your replacement cost for this vehicle. So every time you're using your truck, you are, in, in, in essence, you are uh, spending $4.88 eventually on the replacement of your truck. Additionally, your equipment will have variable costs like your fuel consumption and extra costs for preventative maintenance and for potentially license and insurance. In this case, we're going to estimate that our maintenance, license, and insurance for the truck will be $11,000 over the three-year lifetime that we're gonna have it in operation. So we take that 11,000, we divide it by the number of hours it will work in three years, 6,240, and that gets us an additional $1.76 per hour. Fuel consumption, we can look up the uh, expected fuel consumption and uh, 
knowing how many hours per week it's going to run, we'll say it'll get, it'll, we'll have to spend 30 gallons per week. Well, we Google the average uh, price for fuel, 30 gallons times $3.50, that is $105 per week we're spending just to fuel up this truck and drive it around. Now, uh, that's per week, so we need that in an hour amount. So we take our $105 per week, divide it by 40 hours, and we have $2.63 for fuel per hour that we're operating this truck. So what we've done here is we've created different types of costs for this equipment. The first one is the ownership cost, and that's basically how much it is to replace the piece of equipment. Remember, that's $4.88 per hour. We have our maintenance cost, which is all of our license and insurance and maintenance. That's $1.76 per hour. And then we have our fuel cost, that's $2.63 per hour. If we add all of those together, we get $9.27. And that is your total truck machine rate nine dollars and 27 cents per hour so anytime you're accounting for work being done and the truck is being used you multiply the hours that the truck is being used by the machine rate of nine dollars and 27 cents at this point you might be thinking that uh it becomes very expensive to do business if you have to pay nine dollars and 27 cents you know ten bucks an hour just to have a vehicle uh, how are you going to account for all of these different costs for all your different pieces of equipment well you can rent it in addition to owning it how do you know if it's better to rent or to own well doing this machine rate method is basically your guide uh, if your cost per hour is equal to or higher than a rental cost then you're probably not using the equipment enough to justify its purchase so for example can you rent a pickup truck for less than nine dollars and 27 cents per hour the answer is no i think the cheapest i see around is the home depot trucks that you can rent for twenty dollars an hour something like that and so um, usually it's in your interest to purchase the pickup truck whereas uh, something that you may use only once or twice a year. When you do this machine rate method, you'll discover that uh, it has a very high dollar per hour. And it might be cheaper just to pick it up at a rental yard and then drop it back off without having to do any maintenance or storage or replacement later on. There's other considerations in the rent or own debate. Um, it's not just about the machine rate and the dollars per hour sometimes, because you have to think about what we call the opportunity cost. So sometimes if you purchase equipment, that will be freeing up your labor to be able to do other tasks. So you don't need to rent a piece of equipment if you're already gonna pay someone to be doing work. But sometimes you may decide, if I purchase this equipment, it will significantly reduce the hours of labor, and then it can pay for itself in that way. But uh, pay attention, there's other costs of ownership and including storage. You may need to end up renting a larger space or a storage yard just to hold all of the equipment that you end up purchasing. Finally, with the big four, we're gonna look at our subcontractors. And a subcontractor is another company or person who you hire to get a job done and the client is paying you and then you are paying the subcontractor. That's why they're called subcontractors. For landscape maintenance, many times you will subcontract out irrigation work. So if there's a repair or a break that needs to be done, you can subcontract the irrigation work uh, if you are a landscape maintenance person, you may subcontract any kind of installation work. Or if you are a installer, you may subcontract any kind of maintenance work. So many times these different companies end up working for each other in different capacities. Additionally, if there's any cleaning requirements, like 
for our project where you're you have a public parking lot and you may want to uh, pay a subcontractor to come out once or twice a year and uh, with a truck or a piece of equipment clean off the streets or the parking lot with pressure washing then that would be something you could subcontract out it's important to remember that a subcontractor is an independent business person or a company and they don't work for you and especially they don't work under your direction so the way it works is if you hire a subcontractor or a company you hire them to perform a service that your company is either not qualified or uh, cannot do efficiently or may just choose not to do for economic sake you can set the standard for how that subcontractor should do their work but it's not up to you to be out there supervising employees of a subcontractor and this is where it becomes really important to find good businesses that you really like to work with that you can trust because then uh, it eliminates some of the risk because ultimately the client if they are unhappy with the job will come back to you as the main contractor on this project when you're preparing an estimate and you know you're going to have a subcontractor do part of the job then the subcontractor needs to give you the estimate for that part of the job you cannot estimate and tell them what uh, they need to do it for their costs may be more or less than what you think they are so usually you'll be asking your subcontractors to provide their own bid for that part of the job and just pay attention remember that their bid will include their own overhead their own profit markup and it should because they need to stay in business as well and so when you use subcontractors you are typically paying more than what you would pay to do the job but you may not be optimized to do that job well so it can still save you money to hire out a subcontractor but just know that they're going to be making a profit as well on your job you'll be paying a bit extra and here we just reiterate the point anytime you use a subcontractor your bid in that area will probably be higher than a company that can do that job by themselves therefore typically the less you can use subs the lower your bid price will generally be when getting bids from subcontractors uh, you want to take a few precautions usually you want at least two or three uh, bids so that way you can know if uh, one person is kind of out of line with what they're charging you want the bids to be in writing and you want to be specific with what uh, that bid includes and what it doesn't include so you get that written proposal from your subcontractor before you submit your bid to the client you want to make sure you have them agree to your contract not you agree to theirs that doesn't always work because everyone wants to write their own contract at some point you have to choose who's you're going to sign but you in general uh, would prefer to have your own contract written up how do you write a contract well there's some guidelines we're going to give you but you may also pay a lawyer by the hour a couple hundred bucks an hour just to look over your contract and help you uh, firm it up but typically you want to have them sign, sign a contract signing a contract does not mean uh, you're you are now enemies or you're going to sue each other or you're going to have problems hopefully signing the contract means you're going to be even better collaborators because you have a better understanding of how to work together and a key part of a contract is that both parties need to sign willfully or on with their own uh, recognition that uh, they want to be signing that contract so they should be happy to sign you should be happy to sign as well so there we go there's our big four uh, big four categories of costs and how to recover the costs on your estimate or your bid thank you for listening thank you for paying attention and please let me know if you have any questions or any comments you can uh, add your questions to a discussion on canvas you can email me questions directly you can email them in writing you can take a video of yourself you can use your smartphone to log into canvas and ask questions that way but please reach out let me know what's clear let me know if something is not clear 
This information is going to be used in our project, our ongoing project of our bid, and stay tuned for some worksheets to be able to apply these types of uh, cost recovery methods in our project in the next coming week. Thank you.